Hi everybody, I'd like to introduce you to Feda. Feda is the father of five children, a fisherman who lives by a river in Zambia. Feda's village is facing a serious threat, a serial killer. She kills one child every 30 seconds and 3,000 <coughs> children every day. She's lived amongst us for more than 4,000 years. Her victims are usually the poorest people in the poorest countries. She's merciless. She's brutal. She's relentless. She is malaria. Now the tragedy here is not just the deaths that she causes, but actually how easy it is to beat her and the fact that she's still roaming at large. We have in our hands the perfect malaria busting machine, insecticide treated bed nets. These bed nets, when distributed in an area of high incidence, can reduce the incidence of malaria by at least 50%. Between 2008 and 2010, 294 million bed nets were distributed, mostly for free. And yet, and here's the tragedy, fewer than 5% of the kids in Africa actually get to sleep under this net. What's going on here? Well, when Feda and his community receive these bed nets, they use them for all types of purposes. They use them as fishing nets, they use them as goalposts, and they even use them as wedding wheels. Yeah, these are all creative uses of these bed nets, but they stop the bed nets from being that perfect malaria busting machine that they were meant to be. What's going on here? Well, it's that Feather's community is just not used to sleeping under a bed net. They, even when they receive these bed nets for free, they cannot break away from their habit of sleeping under the open sky. Their behavior is hard to change. Brilliant minds in the international development community call this the last mile problem. It's the same problem that ends up in the use of condoms as balloon animals. To toilet seats as flower pots. It's when good solutions fail because people are not motivated enough to change their behaviors to make them a part of their daily lives. Now, if we want our solutions to work, if we want to solve these problems, what we need to do is we have to change behaviors. <laughs> That's easier said than done. Um, Any one of you who's tried to quit smoking, lose weight, or even try and save more money, knows that behaviors are hard to change, habits are hard to break. Let's say taking the stairs as an example. So mostly when we're standing in front of stairs and an escalator, we're tempted to take the escalator, even when we know that taking the stairs is the healthier option. But what's going on here? I mean, the thing is that that's exactly when you see so many abandoned staircases, next to crowded escalators. There was a similar abandoned staircase that led to a behavioral change experiment in Milan. And what they did was that instead of the staircase, they actually insta installed piano staircases. So every step that the commuter was taking would make music, a tune of their own. So all of a sudden, what was previously an abandoned staircase now became a source of curiosity, fun, and fitness for the people coming out of this underground station. And what you saw was a 66% increase in the number of people taking these stairs instead of the escalator now. So what's happening here is that they're able to change a behavior by making it fun. And for me, this was a huge aha moment. You can actually break habits, even sticky ones, if you make that process so much more fun to do. Now, I had these two big realizations. Behavior change is needed for development solutions to work. And fun is needed for behavior change to work. So how could I create fun and actually inspire social change? And what would my fun thing be? 
What is that one thing that's so much fun that it's synonymous to the word fun? What is that one thing? Fun and games. Yeah, games. Games are fun. They're meant to be fun. They're fun for the one-year-olds, for the 16-year-olds, for the 51-year-olds. Games are fun on the metro in DC or a village in Pakistan. Games are even fun in the North Pole. Games are fun. But in my mind, games are so much more. They appeal to the human psychology in a way that other entertainment tools just don't. In my mind, games are three things wrapped into one. To me, games are a story, a crystal ball, and a trophy all coming together in one. Now, let's take an example to really elaborate on this. So, The Sims. I mean, shout out for all the ones who know The Sims. Yeah. Yay. Okay, good. So, The Sims is, is a game that's hugely popular, and there's a story. You get a bunch of virtual people called Sims. You have to feed them, build houses for them, marry them off to each other, and make sure that they live happily ever after. Then there's the crystal ball. You're able to see the future and the consequences of your action in that future within the span of a few hours. So for instance, this Sims player clearly made a bunch of very bad decisions and is now <laughs> facing the future in her Sims house. <laughs> right? <laughs> and then there's the trophy. You get rewarded for good behavior. A well-decorated house makes your sense happy. So when this story, this crystal ball, and this trophy all come together, the impact that it has on your brains transcends the virtual boundaries of gameplay. It actually comes to that point where the impact, you feel it in your real life. I have a confession for you to make. I have a confession to make. <laughs> when I'm playing Sims, I like to make my Sims squirm in discomfort when they want to go to the loop. I make them wait to the point that they wet themselves in the living room. <laughs> Don't judge, I'm sure you tried it too. <laughs> But see, here's the thing. The virtual discomfort of my Sims actually leaves an impression on my brain that now when I have to go to the loop, I imagine this big blinking red pot on the top of my head urging me to pay attention to my real flesh and blood bladder and make sure I'm not pushing its limits. That's how powerful games can be. And I'm trying to leverage this power for social change. With my social venture grid, Gaming Revolution for International Development, I'm trying to inspire change and fight issues such as oppression, discrimination, and poor health and education outcomes. I'm trying to see if grid can be the nexus of three of my passions, education, technology innovation, and behavioral economics. I was always intrigued by the role that technology can play in helping us solve the problems around us in a more meaningful way. And grid is my way of finding out. To me, grid can be this way, this powerful message to change behavior. Remember our friend Feda? Imagine if he could play a game. A game where malaria is the bad guy and bed nets are his weapon to fight this bad guy. The game would reflect the tough choices that Fed Up faces on a daily basis, the realities of the life that he lives. The game would give Fed Up a safe space to make wrong calls so that he can make the right calls in real life. The game would allow Feda to truly understand how dangerous malaria can be so that he can then use bed nets to protect himself and his family from malaria. Now you're probably wondering, how does a fisherman in Zambia get to play this game? Well, here's the thing. We are at the cusp of the next big technology boom. The global penetration of smartphones. According to the Ericsson Mobility Report, 70% of the world's population will actually have a phone by 2020. We're looking at a world today 
where phones as cheap as $20 are available in areas where even toilets are a luxury. This boom presents a window of opportunity, a window to leverage simple mobile-based games to create social change. And that's the kind of games I'm trying to make. Games that can give people information so they can make better decisions about their lives, their health, their education, their children's futures. Games that are not just a tool for entertainment, but that have the ability to influence and inspire. The Grid team is making many games. Games, for instance, that can contribute to the fight against open defecation in India. Or games that break the stigma around menstrual hygiene in East Africa. Or simple games that can make math learning more fun. This game, Gumbers, challenges its players to take on an alien invasion of mathematics and save math, going from saving numbers to fractions to data to everyday stats. The game will actually be introduced to 500 students in the next three months through a project of the World Bank and the government of Gambia. But what I want to talk to you about today is a game that actually tackles a problem that might be something that many of you face. Have you ever been judged in the first five minutes that someone met you? Based on your gender, the color of your skin, the clothes you were wearing, or the car you were driving? Have you ever been put in a box in someone's mind and have that box become your identity? See, the thing is, that stereotypes are all around us. And what if we do not belong to those stereotypes? What if we are so much more than those stereotypes? Not all girls like the color pink. Not all Asians are good at math. <laughs> <laughs> not all Muslims are terrorists. And not all black people are prone to violence. Stereotypes are dangerous. They're around us and they not only alienate people, but they're the reason behind hate crimes and violence and social conflict. Now, I understand that stereotyping is a behavior that's anchored in the social constructs around us. And yes, I understand that it's hard to change that behavior. But remember, we have the secret weapon for behavior change with us, games. And that's what I decided to do. I decided to make a great game on breaking stereotypes. Stereowide is a game that challenges its players to match tiles of stereotypes, pairs of stereotypes, and then it wipes them for them. So on a time challenge, you go through different pairs of stereotypes, you're matching them, and at the same time, you're watching the game break these stereotypes for you. So for instance, if you match I am African and I live in a jungle. Well, guess what? 40% of the African population lives in urban areas, not jungles. Or the game could break another stereotype for you. I'm a girl and I like the color pink. Well, two out of three girls around you actually prefer blue more than pink. Or I'm a Muslim and I'm a terrorist. Well, guess what? Four out of the previous 12 Nobel Peace Prize winners were Muslims. Stereo White is my way of making sure that we break these stereotypes in a fun and engaging fashion. The Stereo White campaign launches today and I'd love to hear if it changes your behavior. But what I want to leave you with today is not just a nudge to start stereotyping, but a game plan to use digital games for social change. It's actually easier than you think. Most of us at some point in time in our lives has made a game. A game using pencils and paper, sticks and stones, bed sheets and pillows. Games come more naturally to us, sorry, we should be on this slide. Okay. Games come more naturally to us than we think. Games are able to inspire social change, and I urge you to consider this idea. It doesn't have to be, you don't have to be a coder to do it. You don't even have to be a computer science major. It doesn't even have to be on a screen. 
all you need to do is maybe start a competition in your neighborhood on planting trees. Put in a story, put in a leaderboard, and there you have it. Your very own <coughs> game for change. And so before you know it, you'll not only have some great ideas for games, but you'll also get some really nice encouragement as you pursue your passion. Be it the opportunity to share the stage with President Clinton, or give a TED talk to an awesome, awesome audience such as you. Well, here's my game plan. Behavior change cannot be boring. Contextual realities cannot be ignored. Innovation cannot be left to tomorrow. The time is now to leverage the power of games to create a better world. I've committed myself to the cause. The question is, are you game? Yeah. <laughs>